welcome this morning. Um, as you all know, uh, one of the goals of Freshman Transition is to, through your leadership groups, uh, to help you make a wonderful, smooth transition to the high school. And most importantly, in order to do that, um, getting your priorities in academics straight and moving along with your goals and aspirations is really a great part of what we hope to help you to do. One of the highlights of Freshman Transition for the past few years has been this presentation by Mr. Meyer, who speaks about organization, study skills, setting your goals for the future. And not only is this an important and meaningful program for you ninth graders, but senior leaders always come away with lots of good information to store as they move on beyond Bronxville High School. So I'm really happy to introduce uh, Mr. Meyer to you this morning. After the program, you'll be meeting in your smaller groups to discuss what you have heard this morning. So Mr. Meyer, thank you so much for doing this. Thanks. Um, if you guys have a notebook, I'd, I'd ask you to take it out so you can take some notes. If you don't have a notebook, uh, that's unfortunate. Um, the other thing, though, besides taking out a notebook, I really shouldn't see your phones. If you think you've got something better to do, just leave. I don't need to waste my time. So phones should be away. You shouldn't see them. You can take your hat off. If you have a notebook, you can take that out. All right, so each year I give this presentation, I think this is like the sixth or seventh time I've given the presentation. It's always something that sort of is an evolving process. And there's a bunch of different components to the presentation and hopefully the conversations that follow. Uh, I try to make sure that it's relevant to you who are entering or moving in deeper into ninth grade and then those of you who are leaving the school in 12th grade. I mean, if something's not applicable in both cases, it's probably not valuable at all. The other piece is some of you know me personally, and I, um, you've been either lucky or unlucky to have me as your teacher. And you might, others might not even know who I am, so my name is Bill Meyer. And the reason I think, or one of the reasons that might this talk in particular might be appropriate for me to give is I think I've counted, I've been in school something like 29 years of my life, right? So hopefully it will end soon, but it's been a long, long journey. Uh, I'm finishing up my PhD, which I've been doing for 10 years now. So I have more degrees than I know what to do with them. And I feel like I've been in places, challenging places, um, where I've been pressed and pressured and figured out hopefully systems that work, not just for me, but are valuable for other students as well. And honestly, anything that I tell you, it's just an offering. Take it if it works for you, leave it if it doesn't. And there's two parts of this talk besides, well, there's the piece that is the academic aspects, and then there's the piece that sort of are the life aspects. And I, I kind of have this philosophy like, if something is not applicable to your life, if you don't find value in it, like it, it's not important, don't do it. So looking at how things connect and seeing those connections across what you're doing in the classroom with what you're doing in your own lives and the lives you wanna live and build is really important. So the title of the talk is pretty ambitious. Finding your flow, getting into the college of your dreams and enjoying every minute of high school. Right, I mean, that would be everyone's dream. And I can see so many smiling faces in the 12th grade who have embraced and embodied that. Now, if you actually look at your 12th grade leaders today, look in their eyes, you will see a brokenness and a defeatedness that hopefully you yourselves will never embody, right? They're, they're shattered individuals. Um, I'm just teasing, they're, they're a pretty strong group. So the first thing I'm gonna talk about is the study skill aspect. So you don't have to write down this quote, but uh, it's, I think, a pretty valuable, valuable quote because I actually came up with a quote. So one of the first rules of presentations, if you can't find a quote online that suits your purpose, just quote yourself. It's like the most 
powerful thing you can do. So learning to be strategic and efficient is just as important as being smart and knowledgeable. So as I had mentioned before, uh, you know, I was very fortunate to go to a pretty amazing high school, two amazing high schools actually, one in London and one in Detroit, um, both, both really strong prep schools. And I did my undergraduate at Dartmouth, got a graduate degree at Harvard, did some graduate work in Michigan, and now I'm finishing up at NYU. So it, it never seems to end. But there's something I never did in all those degrees, in all that work. Never pulled an all-nighter. Never really did any work beyond about 10.30 at night. Now, I know your schedules are a little different, but this is the first sort of nugget that I would offer you. And there's a lot of parallels between writing and studying, but the first piece is, if you get to a place where you are working past 11 and into 12, that's the time when you should go to bed and you get up early the next day. You make extra time in the morning. And there's a lot of research that has shown one hour in the morning is worth two hours at the end of the night in terms of productivity. So it's far more valuable for you to get rest than for you to like grind it out all night. The second piece that I would say is if you are hearing people trying to posture and perform studying and how hardcore they are because they stayed up all night, like those are people you do not want to model your life after. And if you watch those individuals, you will see that over the course of the year, if that's sustained, there will be some underlying issues that will become very, very present in their lives. Like the most important thing I will tell you about school and life is sleep. You've got to get sleep. Like that should be your number one priority. And it can be very challenging at times. And I know it's something we devalue in our community and sometimes within the school, but it is the bedrock for everything. When you are not getting a good night's sleep, everything else becomes harder and more challenging. And the way that I would equate sleep and, and what this is really about, it's like all day long, you're gathering all this information, all this material. Sleep is that time when sort of those librarians in your head run around and start to put away the material. And if you are not getting sleep, like extended amounts of sleep, like six to eight hours a night, all of that stuff in your head is just scattered. You don't have the opportunity to internalize it. And so I would start with that premise, like you have to get rest, you have to create time for rest. Do not neglect that piece. Now, if that's the foundation, the question is, the first part is like, how do you study? What's the best way to study? Now, I noticed the people who have notebooks here are students from my own class, right? So they're, they're amazing students. I also told them, you better bring your notebook or I'm gonna yell at you when you come into this assembly. So they all have their notebooks, they're all studious, they're like open, but the other crazy thing is they haven't written down a word. So, I mean, I don't wanna call people out here, but I can see right down into your notebooks, which is, which is a little, Oh, wow. So let's talk about tips for studying. There's three, three things you have to do to study. Like, how do you internalize information? Everyone tells you like, oh, you need to study hard. You need to make sure you study hard tonight. But the reality is a lot of people don't even know what that is. And a lot of people are very ineffective or inefficient. So here are the three steps to internalizing any piece of information, any knowledge uh, from your studying in your work. The first piece is you got to break it. So I'm going to talk a little bit more about this later on, but the foundation of your studying should be your notes. It's your notebook. Like whenever you are in class, you should take notes. I would strongly discourage you from using a laptop because when you have a laptop out open, there are a thousand other distractions. Like sit there with your hand and write the notes physically. And sometimes it might not be that valuable at the time for you to do it, but that is the thing that will keep you awake in the class. So when you go to college or when you move forward in your, your classes here at Bronxville, write your notes by hand. That is such an important piece, right? The second thing is you start with the notes and we'll talk about breaking it in a few minutes. You got to build material in a new way. So one of the ways we internalize information is you have to create something, you have to construct something, but you don't reconstruct what you already have. So many people make the mistake of like, oh, you know, to study for this test, I recopied my notebook. Like that, that's ridiculous. Or, oh, I just reread the textbook. That is a giant waste of your time. 
Don't ever repeat your studying, your behavior twice. Like, okay, I got a test. I already read the, read the uh, textbook. What would be something different I could do? Go through the study guide, highlight the key pieces of information, and read that separately. Like, that's how you should be looking at things. How do they supplement what you already have? Don't repeat the same processes twice. The third thing which we'll talk about is internalization. And this is the challenging piece, but it's something you have to consider when you're studying. Whenever you are taking a test, you've got to be strategic. You also have to be predictive. Like, your teachers are pretty predictable if you actually listen and pay attention in class. Probably nine times out of 10, you could guess what an essay question would be. Nine times out of 10, you should be able to predict what the multiple choice questions might be. But when you are studying, you always look at what you have to do differently, because there's two types. It's almost like when you're training for sprinting versus you're training for long distance runs, like it's different muscle groups that you activate. When you are studying for soft recall, so soft recall is like multiple choice matching word bank. It's a different approach. The reason I call this soft recall is because the material and information is there available in front of you. So we'll talk about how you study for that, and that's a little bit different than hard recall. The one thing I would say about any multiple choice or any test you take or reading that you do, you need to underline, you need to cross things out, like you need to actively attack the documents, the pages. Don't ever let a teacher reuse your test or your material as if you've never touched it. It's that physical engagement, just like we said, that physical engagement when you take notes that is so valuable. The most challenging pieces to study for, to be honest, are the hard recall things. That's like writing an essay in class, short answers, fill in the blanks. That is the material where you have to pull that information out. You don't have it available in front of you. You don't have the right answer in front of you. You've got to recall it. So given those two approaches, you should always think about that as you are preparing to study. So let's talk about the first piece, breaking it. So, as I said before, your notes are your foundation in any class. You should take good notes. When you go to college, the most important thing you could do, besides sleep, is go to class, right? It's gonna become, I mean, right now you're like, oh, I can go to class, yeah, 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 my classes start at 10 in the morning, that's super easy, oh my God. And then all of a sudden when you're in college, you're gonna find like a thousand reasons why 10 in the morning just isn't working out for you, right? And then the next semester you're like, 11 in the morning really isn't working out for me either. And then you're like, well, mom, dad, I find that I work best in the afternoon and I usually don't wake up till like 12.30, right? Or around lunchtime. So, and, and then all of a sudden you're missing all these classes. You have to go to class. And for those of you who actually go to class and you guys are in high school, you're, you're basically mandated to go to class. You're there, use the time, take notes, write things down. So when you have those notes, the first part is breaking it up. So when I have a good set of notes, like a nice notebook to work from, I go through and I highlight the notes. But I highlight them using different colors, focusing on what I think is the most important pieces of information that have been covered. Once I have that information, I begin to break up my notes so that I can construct them into something new. I actually gave you, here's an example of someone's um, notes that they constructed for a study guide, like your notebook is your study guide. And what this individual did, this is a student I had, I think like three years ago, and she took her notebook and whenever she'd take notes, she'd just write like a long list of notes. Everything that was set of value, she just wrote it like a laundry list. Boom, 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 boom. And then right before a test, what she would do is she'd go through, she'd highlight what she thought was most important, subdivide that, and then rewrite her notes in paper that has no lines forcing her to reorganize them. So that's the key thing. Rather than rewriting her notes in a laundry list, she created this whole other system. And something I would write down and encourage all of you to do is rewrite things using colors. Like we as human beings are very visual. If you can associate colors or shapes or images to information, you will internalize it in a deeper way than if you just rewrite stuff in the same grain size and on the same line paper. The other piece you have to do is you have to learn it. And this is probably the most challenging part, and this is where the soft recall differs from the hard recall. When you are studying for a test and it's soft recall, you just have like a quiz and it's multiple choice. All you have to do is read over those study guides that you created. 
But when you are studying for something that's hard recall, like you have to know the information, that's where you take your study guides, you've got to flip them over, and you literally have to generate the information yourself. And what's valuable to do, and there's a lot of information and research showing this, is try to connect it to something physical. So like if you go for a run, after you've created a study guide, go for a run, and while you're on your run, think about, can I go through all the major topics that were on that study guide? Can I like visually see that in my mind? Because is that ability to recreate this, the study guide or the information on that study guide is what's gonna allow you to gather evidence or answer an essay question or deal with a short answer. It's like that deep internalization. Now, if you wanna study in a group, it is terribly ineffective unless you have studied alone first. The way groups work and the way groups are most effective is filling gaps in what you do and don't know. Like, don't go into a group like, okay, I'm gonna go study at the library this weekend for two hours or three hours with my friends, it's gonna be great. And then you just sort of punt on doing anything until you have those two or three hours. The problem with that is like, you haven't internalized anything yourself, you don't even know what you know and you don't know. So what you wanna do is when you're studying in a group, you wanna make sure you take advantage of studying first alone when you come to the group, you have specific questions to ask them. It's the same thing that in when you are approaching your teachers. Come with specific questions after you've already done the work. This is like the most effective use of your time, right? So if we think about the study process and how you internalize information, it's not easy, but there's a couple other things I'd say. Do it over multiple nights. The more nights you spend doing something, the more you will internalize it. I mean, how many times have you studied for a, a quiz, a test, or whatever, and then like two days later, you have no recollection of the information, right? And if you were cramming the night before, your, your mind does not have the ability to internalize that information, process that information, like hold on to that information. Try to break up your studying into smaller chunks. And I've said this about writing, and I'd say this about studying, Study in like 45, 50 minute chunks, uninterrupted. Then take like 10 minute breaks. When you take those breaks, make sure you're not looking at a screen. Go do something that's mindless, restful, totally disconnected from the studying process. That is so important. And honestly, the best thing you could do is try to do like an hour of work before you eat dinner and then do like two or three hours after dinner. But use dinner as a way of breaking up your evenings. And the same thing is through, uh, true when you're talking about a long weekend. Now, studying is only part of this, right? And, and I think one of the most challenging pieces is like when you're studying and you're working and you can't figure out like why some things are working and why other things aren't, um, in a class in particular, bring what you are doing to your teachers. Show them what you've created. Ask them, like, am I missing something? I think the biggest secret I have to offer you, and we're gonna talk about this in the second part, is like everything is based on relationships. Everything. There is nothing objective in school. Like every time I grade a test, every time I grade an essay, the first thing I look at is the name of the person who wrote that. And I can tell you personally, if I know that student or that individual has come to my room and has demonstrated or shown me that they have put in time and work, as I am going through that essay, I'm like cheering them on, hoping that they can deliver, you know, something that is strong and successful. And as a result, of course that informs how I grade that. Of course it informs how I give the feedback. And, and honestly, this, the opposite is true. When I know there's a student who hasn't done anything in the class, like they don't even show up with their notebook most days, I cannot wait for them to turn in their essay because I'm gonna light that thing up like a Christmas tree, right? <laughs> like red all over it, right? And I can see some of you guys are terrified now, right? But everything is relationships. Now, the other piece, <laughs> some of you just turn in your essays, you're like, oh crap, right? So there's a lot of, lot of pieces here. and This is the second half of the talk, and I think it's probably the, more, the most valuable. Like, it's how do you develop those relationships with your teachers, and, and how can those re relationships serve you? So 
Relationships are a foundational part. If you, if you start with sleep for studying, relationships are a key piece to the learning process. One, it will like enrich your whole experience, but relationships are the bedrock for like everything we do here in the school and in the community, right? So the first thing that I would say to you guys, and these are sort of the 29 rules that I've filtered down into living. So the first thing I'd say is go slow. Everyone often tells you like, oh, you know, you don't have enough time, you gotta hurry up, slow things down. Try to find space and time in your life. You guys are in ninth grade, a lot of you are, some of you are not, right? So you still have some autonomy over what you choose. It's gonna be like pancakes, and the stack's gonna get bigger and bigger and bigger, and you're gonna have more and more responsibility. And in the process of having more responsibility, we often begin to rush. And the more we rush, the less we get out of our experiences, our friendships, like all those moments in life. Second thing I'd say is avoid distractions. Like when you are studying, do not study with your phone open. Like don't study their texting or like having like notifications. Just put your hand down for a second. I can take comments and questions. Like you want to be focused. You want to be locked in. That is a waste of your time. And honestly, if you're disconnected from people for an hour, they're gonna be like, what's up? You know, what's going on? And then you're gonna sort of seem more mysterious and engaging to like, oh my God, you know, where's Bill? What's up with Bill? I haven't heard from Bill for a few hours, right? This guy's kind of kind of intriguing, mysterious. Like, I want to know more about him, right? So when you're constantly available, what happens? You're like, oh my God, Noah, will you leave me alone, right? Just giving you a hard time. So it's like you don't always want to be on your phone. You want to make sure that you have space and time. Second thing, multitasking turns out is like the worst thing you could do. All this research has shown, like, when you are doing something, do one thing at a time. When you try to multitask multiple things simultaneously, like none of them are done as well or as effectively. So be very specific about like what you're doing and focus on doing that alone and then move to the next thing. I know this is a crazy thing and it's something I always struggle with, but I've been doing this more. I've been leaving my phone downstairs. Um, and I've got a lot of interruptions in the night because I have a three, three-year-old and a three-month-old who uh, like, <laughs> like they need attention at different times in the night. And what I was finding was happening over the last few months is like when I would wake up to go help my little guy, uh, I would go back into bed and then I'd grab my phone and like check a score or see what's an update. And it was taking me like twice as long to fall asleep. One of the best things you could do is like either put your phone in the drawer Put your, leave your phone in another room, but try not to look at your phone before you go to bed or when you wake up. Honestly, the number of times you probably look at your phone right before bed and it's produced anxiety or angst or you feel like someone's doing something you're not doing or all of a sudden this person texts you and you need to do this thing is like it all is disrupting that like key piece of finding rest and giving yourself a little bit of a break. Now, I talked about this already, but this is like the most important part. And what I love coming in here right now is I look out and several of these individuals in this room, more than several, I'm writing recommendations for. I'm like, oh crap, the room just changed. <laughs> this, this talk got real serious, right? In fact, I think I just uploaded your recommendation. So um, you're not gonna have much of a chance at, at that school now. No, I'm just teasing, <laughs> I, I'm teasing. I wrote you an amazing rec. I was, I was so happy with it. Sometimes I read them like, this is pretty good, right? But here's the thing, and actually Charlotte's a great example, and actually most of the recommendations and the people in this room who I'm writing for, I have a pretty good relationship with. I'll tell you why I have a good relationship with them. One, I've, I've taught them multiple times. If you have a teacher you like, a teacher you connect with, like take as many classes with that teacher that you possibly can. That allows them to get to know you, and you get to know them. The second piece is like, if they have a club, if they're involved with something outside of the school, if they lead a trip, go with them, be connected with them. Charlotte has been a part of meditation club for like four years, right? She's like a bedrock. And one of the things I, I said in the recommendation, and I will say it to you, is the thing that's so amazing about Charlotte is like, it doesn't matter if it's like a Sunday night, right? Or like a Monday morning. When I forget something, if I send her an email, She's just like, I got this one. She does it. 
And to me, that is the foundation of a strong relationship. Can I count on that person? Can they count on me? Right? It's not just about like, oh, do they show up in class? Do they sit there? It's like, what do they bring to a room? What do they bring through their questions, their conversations? Like when I sit down and I have a conversation with people, the stuff that always drives me crazy is like, at the end of the summer, I'm like, okay, how was your summer? And we start, we start talking. And then after the conversation's over, I'm like, yo, that person never asked me how my summer was. Like, what's up with that? You know, like I'm a human being. I just had a baby. What did you do this summer? I mean, I didn't have the baby. My wife had the baby, but like <laughs> we had a baby, right? And it's, it's you've got to show an interest. And, and the reason I come back to the relationship thing is look around you. This is one of the largest ninth grade classes. One of the largest ninth grade classes, right? And everyone in Bronxville does the same thing, right? They take the same classes, they play the same sports, they end up applying to the same schools. I think Boston College is number one and like uh, Michigan's number two or something statistically. And everyone thinks they're like slipping into Boston College because they're not gonna tell anyone. <laughs> so everyone applies to the same places, they do the same things, and the things that distinguish you, the pieces that can distinguish you, it's like your recommendation, someone who can speak to who you are as a person. But when you're doing the same thing and you're not really making a connection or you're not investing in your teachers or those relationships, like what do you have at the end of the day? You don't have much. So if you do not invest in those relationships, like those are the things that will pay dividends at the end of this experience. You guys are beginning this journey. So many people are at the end of it, but take the teacher, not the class. A great teacher can bring any subject to life. A bad teacher will take the class, the, the subject you love the most and kill it for you. So you find someone who inspires you, engages you, take every class you can with that individual. Look at your, your four years here and your four years beyond here as like an arc that could speak to your passions, your interests, your loves. And that's where a teacher can really facilitate that in a deep way and so can you. We already talked about prioritizing rest, food, but also prioritize time alone. And this time alone is not like on your phone looking at social media. Like actually make time alone for yourself. This is so important in like all of the distraction, all the distortion that exists in our lives. Like we have to have moments of solitude. This is where we can find our center. This is where you can actually connect with what you are interested in. It's always fascinating to me when you ask students at the end, like, where do you want to go to college? And then as soon as you guys get into college, the next question they're going to ask you is like, what are you majoring in? And a lot of this is really tough for us because we've never actually sat with ourselves to ask, what do I actually care about? What am I interested in? Not what my parents are interested in, not what my teachers are interested in, like what am I interested in? And that's why it's so important, like if you're given a research paper or you have the chance to do something that you can creatively bring your whole self to, sit with yourself, think about what that is, and then move forward. Without doing that, you concede so much of your own personal power. Now, I bring this up because everything is connected. And I'm not like some diet guru or anything like that. But like the stuff you eat totally impacts how you feel, how you study, what's going on in your life. I think I have a pretty simple strategy. Like eat more greens in your life, less black and whites. Like less coffee, hopefully you're not drinking coffee because it's a long road if you started now, right? And less whites, like less refined sugars, less flour, things like that. If you are aware, and actually pay attention to how you feel after lunch versus the beginning of the day, notice what you are putting in your body and how it is actually affecting your mind, the way you engage and interact with those around you, like be mindful of that stuff because it is all connected. The next piece I would say is, and I love this one, always use a compass, sometimes use a map. A lot of people wanna be like, okay, I'm gonna do X, Y, and Z to get into this college. Worry less about the specific college and worry more about the places that are gonna support your passions and your interests. It's not about getting into like the top ranked college. That's not gonna give you a happy life. 
It's not going to offer you much fulfillment because I'll let you in on a secret. You're going to get into that college. You're going to get there. The next thing you're going to have to figure out is the internship. Then you're going to have to figure out if you can get into the top graduate school so you can get the top job, right? And that pressure never goes away. Recalibrate your right life rather around what are the places, the spaces where I can connect with my passions, my interests, people who have those passions, who push me. That is a great way to live a life. As we go down, focus on the process, not the outcome. The same idea. So many people are like, what's my grade? What, what did I get on this test? But think about what am I getting out of this class? What am I getting out of my relationships? What am I getting out of these four years? Trust your instincts. This is a huge thing, and I think we like totally devalue it. No one will teach you this, but it's just like anything in your life. What you put your attention and energy into will grow. What you put your attention and energy into will grow. I sometimes go into the supermarket. It's kind of a crazy thing to do, and I'll ask myself, like, what do we need for this week? And then I'll go around, and I literally will just intuitively take things that I think are, are appropriate. Like, like, oh, I think we need four apples. Like, that's what came to mind. And I'll get those four apples. Like, nine times out of ten, as the week unfolds, it works out to be, like, the perfect amount of food. I do the same thing with the school. I'll walk towards the school building and I'll ask myself, which door should I go through? And I did that today. And I came in a side door that I don't usually come into. When I came down the hall, there was like a third grader and she was crying. And then I, I stopped and I sat, we talked, and I, and I made sure her teacher came out and we had a conversation. I would not have been in that hall had I not asked myself that question and then gone with my intuition about which of those doors I should have entered. And be aware of that. You have incredible intuitive power, but if you don't use it, it won't grow. Always find op opportunities to help others. And that was kind of a perfect example of what I just shared with you. Don't be afraid to cry, but also never forget to laugh. And I think this is like the most important piece. We take things so seriously, and it feels like school is like all about this tightrope walk. You've got to be willing to laugh at yourself, make mistakes, but most of all, and I would write this down, like, be willing to be vulnerable. If you want to connect with someone else, your openness, your honesty, and your vulnerability is the thing that creates those access points in our relationships. No one really knows what they're doing. Some people just fake it a little better than others. Honestly, I, I don't know what I'm doing. Sometimes I forget that I'm actually in a high school until I like go outside Mr. Russert's class and they're talking about like STDs or something like that. And then I go home, I'm like, oh my God, my life is in a high school. How strange is that? How did I end up permanently in this like high school world, right? But I actually don't perceive that. And I'm always thinking, I think this year I turned, I, well, I don't think, I know, I turned 40, right, in November. And it's kind of wild. And someone once told me this and I'll share it with you. I think about myself, okay, what have the last 10 years been like, but what do I want out of the next 10 years of my life? And I remember someone saying, and I think I shared this with some of you, most people overestimate what they can do in one year and underestimate what they can do in 10. Now, I look back at the last 10 years. When I was 30, I wasn't married. I didn't have children. I hadn't started a PhD program. I look back at these 10 years, I never could have imagined all of the experiences that I've had, all the places I've got to travel, these two beautiful kids who've come into my life, you know, the depth of my relationship and connection with my wife, and we've definitely been through challenges and stuff in our whole process and journey. And then I look at, like, I've, I've been able to publish four books, finish, I'm finishing a PhD, all of this just happened in 10 years. Like, change the lens in which you are looking at your life. It's not just in a year. And ask yourself, what do you want out of the next four years? You will be amazed at what you can achieve. Don't trust someone who has all the answers. And the more important piece is, don't trust someone who doesn't dance, right? And, and the reason I add this piece up is like, it's always, you should always be mindful of people who like take themselves too seriously or are uncomfortable dancing because they feel like they look like an idiot. My wife always says when I dance, you are gonna injure someone, Bill. <laughs> like, you are a danger to yourself and those around you. But it doesn't stop me from dancing. So, put your energy into the questions, not the answers. 
When you feel lost, go outside. And I love this second one, and this is actually a friend. When you feel really lost, go outside barefoot. I had a good friend, and she was in a training for yoga. And one of her requirements was every day her practice was to go outside barefoot and stand on the ground, like feel the earth. And she had to do this over a six-month period. Rain, snow, it did not matter. And she said there's something about feeling the ground beneath your feet that grounds you, like brings you out of your head. And that is such an important piece to remember. There's no perfect school or college. You just make the college right. Time is your friend. You need to try to honor it at least once a day. And a great way of doing that is just take a deep breath. Don't believe everything you think and almost never believe everything you hear. That's a really powerful piece and I often say this in meditation. Like you don't have to believe all your thoughts. They're not all true. And, and you don't have to react to all your thoughts as well. Sometimes the best way to help someone is just to hold the space to listen. And I often share this, and even as I shared that story of that little girl this morning, and I'm not a great listener by any stretch of the imagination, it's something like I really have to work at, but they've done a lot of research in terms of doctors, and they, they wanted to see how long does it take a doctor before they tell uh, a patient what's wrong with them when a patient first comes in to start talking about their illnesses or their pains or struggles. And they found that it's 27 seconds. That most doctors will only listen for 27 seconds before they give a diagnosis or they interrupt that person. A lot of times when you are sitting with someone, and I can promise you, your friends, yourself, you're gonna face challenges. You don't have to have the answers for those individuals. But being present is like the greatest gift you can offer them. And there's so many reasons to get distracted and like people look down at their phone and they think they should be doing something else. But sometimes just sitting with someone is, is the most powerful and healing thing you can offer them. Wait 24 hours before you make any major decisions in your life. College, tattoos, relationships, right? Like it's good to have a full 24 hour cycle to sort of feel the ebbs and flows of all the emotions you have around something. And that's also connected to that idea of space and time. Be active, but not aggressive, which is totally different from a lot of the things we teach you. Be kind, but never competitive. Hold your friends close and your family closer. Relationships are built on trust, not text, right? And like, if you really wanna think about your friendships and the people you connect to the most, those are the people you can trust not the ones you necessarily have the longest thread or feed with. And the last thing I mentioned is meditate. Now I'm not saying everyone should meditate, but I do think it's important to have moments of reflection in your life. If that's for you journaling, writing things down, if it's for you going for a run, find things that help you slow down. Just as I said in the beginning, it's like those paces and that way of living is so much, it's so, powerful and it, it can be so transformative when you're rushing through everything you're getting nothing out of it so you think about these next four years they are going to go by so so quickly and i think the last piece that i'll share with you which is another quote from myself <laughs> we all live this life to a rhythm deep within our being a rhythm that only we can hear slow down listen carefully and when you find that rhythm make every choice every action and every word of your life fall in time with that beat. And um, part of the journey is trying to hear it, part of the journey is trying to live it, and I think part of the journey is just trying to honor it. So hopefully maybe there are one or two things you can get out of all of that. Um, thank you guys for making the space and time. And uh, have, have a great time. All right, um, does anybody have any questions before Mr. Meyer returns to um, Nirvana? You said to go slow, but like, how do you go slow? Like, what stops you from rushing? Because I feel like I always start to rush without realizing it. Yeah, that's a great question. And, and honestly, I don't always embody these things. This summer, I was rushing. Like, when you have a, a little, two little beings, sometimes, 
things get crazy. And I, I was rushing down the stairs with the laundry basket and I walked into the couch and then I broke my pinky. And, uh, you know, I went to the doctor, they're like, oh, it's broken in two places. And then people are like, what's wrong with you? Uh, how did this happen? And the reality is I was rushing, right? And it was like, at that moment, I was like, whoa, I need to just slow things down. And I'm not saying you have to do this all the time, but I think one of the ways that you can slow down is one, ask yourself when you're, when you're about to do something, is this something you really wanna do? Like, do I really need to sign up for this activity? Uh, is this a course? Like, do I need to take this AP course? Is this something I wanna do? Or am I just doing this because other people are telling me? And when you start to make choices deliberately and intentionally, you'll find that there's like a little more space, there's a little more breath, and things can be a little slower, right? But when you find that you're making choices that you think other people want you to make, or you're doing things that you think other people want you to do, it's like the world is at a pace that's not your own, and I think that's where you feel, feel the speed. Any other questions? Yeah. Um, how do you break Wow, two great questions. So how do you break procrastination? I procrastinate a lot, it's true. Uh, I always sort of incentivize myself. So like one of the things I, I like to do the least as a teacher is grade. I, I really don't like grading. And um, so what I do to incentivize a grade is like, or incentivize me grading, is I give myself a reward. So I'm like, okay, if I grade this stack of essays, I'm gonna go get like a uh, pumpkin spice latte or something like that, which I don't usually get. And so I go, I get it, I'm drinking it, smells good, feels good, and I'm like, okay, I'm gonna work because I'm giving myself that reward. So subtle rewards like that. And then in terms of the music piece, that's also a great question. Like, and actually Chris was mentioning this uh, yesterday. It's like music can really alter our moods. And when you study, I don't study with music that's like intense or full of words. Like, yeah, you can have soothing music and calming music, but that stuff becomes another distraction, right? I even find that when I come in the classroom, like sometimes when I come in the classroom, I've got one of those wireless speakers and I'll put on music. But generally, if it's music that's got like words, honestly, uh, I'm just not that productive in the morning. So sometimes we, and you can hold off and be like, oh, I'll listen to this when I finish doing this work. So that's like a great way of doing it, a possibility. Say that again. Oh, what kind do I listen to? Uh, <laughs> all kinds. I listen to all kinds. I think this morning I was listening to Jingle Bells. Um, my son has this bizarre obsession with Christmas music. So he was shouting at our Google to play Jingle Bells. But I listen to anything, anything. I mean, here, here's something I'm only telling you guys because it's a, it's a dark secret. And please don't think less of me, although you probably won't think, think of this. But recently, and I don't know why, but I've, <laughs> I've been really into Post Malone, which is like, which is really, really not good. It, it represents everything I'm against, exploiting music and stuff, and I don't know. So anyway, listen to whatever makes you happy. Last question. Shh. Wow, that's a great question, and probably way beyond me. So what Henry asked is like, when do you get a relationship that might get toxic or actually prevent you from being effective or productive in your work? Um, like, I think probably the hardest thing for all of us is just to be honest, particularly with people who are closest to us. And Usually when you find yourself like someone's becoming very dependent on you or you're becoming very dependent on them That's that's a point where maybe you pause and you say to that person like, you know um, Just being honest about how this is not productive for either of us right or the friendship um, Honestly, I've been just as immature as many of you guys and like when relationships go sour sometimes I just disappear uh, which is not an effective way of handling it. But my best relationships and the relationships that I think are the most meaningful, even the ones that have challenges, 
are when I'm just honest with that person. But I also have to be honest with myself. Probably the hardest person I've ever had to be really honest with uh, is my mom, which I think all our relationships with our moms can also can be some of the most challenging as we sort of navigate our lives against their expectation for our lives. Uh, but I think in the places when I've been able to be honest with her, she's been able to be supportive and productive and like healthy. The places where I feel like I'm not honest, um, it's, it's not good for either of us. So that's a great question. So I hope you guys have some good conversations as you go forward in the rest of the, the morning. But thank you so much. Thank you.